Good morning, everyone. Enough coffee this morning? Good morning, everyone. Good morning. <laughs> I'm Cheryl Parker, Regional Director of Public and Government Affairs for AAA Central and Great Plains Regions. And I want to welcome you to the first Technology Takes the Wheel in Oklahoma. A little bit of background. Our club uh, started the Technology Takes the Wheel speaker series in collaboration with the University of Toledo in 2017 uh, to really elevate public conversation around connected and autonomous vehicles and the transformation of transportation. Since that time, we've expanded um, in collaboration with universities from Connecticut to Kansas. So we are absolutely thrilled to be a part of the Oklahoma Traffic Safety Conference today and thank the, the Oklahoma Highway Safety Office for inviting us to be here. We are really, really happy with this opportunity and hope that you will enjoy the presentation. I also want to thank our great team at AAA Oklahoma, Leslie Gamble, who many of you know, who's been working really hard. Let's give her a hand. <laughs> And Mark Medea, he's, he's been working hard too this morning. Uh, he's based in Tulsa. Uh, a fantastic team that we have. So we, we're really appreciative of the opportunity to be here. And now I'd like to introduce our speaker. Jillian Gracia is from the AAA National Office. She serves as Executive Director of Advocacy and Communications. She directs federal and state government relations and traffic safety advocacy, policy and programs for AAA, as well as leading internal and external communications efforts. She manages a staff of policy and public health professionals and oversees the development and implementation of public policy strategy of concern to AAA members, AAA business operations, including mobility and transportation safety, energy, and consumer automotive issues. She's been with AAA for 23 years and has worked on a number of comprehensive initiatives to address distracted driving, impaired driving, improve teen and senior driver safety, and advocate for transportation funding and innovation. She has represented AAA on a number of coalitions with national transportation and safety organizations, including service as chairman of the ITS America Board of Directors, membership on the Transportation Safety Advancement Group, service on the steering committee of the Road to Zero Coalition, and 2008 chairman of the Road Gang, an affiliation of transportation professionals based in Washington, D.C. She also serves on the board of the Public Affairs Council. And I know all of us at AAA thank her for her support um, from testimony at state houses on connected and autonomous vehicles throughout the country and being here with us today. Please welcome Jill and Gracia. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Cheryl, and, and thank you, um, the organizers uh, of, of this event, for the opportunity to be here today. It's great to be in a room full of traffic, passionate traffic safety advocates. And before I dive into the topic of um, the, sort of the future of transportation and automated vehicles, I did want to take a moment as well to thank you for all that you do to improve uh, traffic safety in this state. Um, we have an opportunity, I at the national level, to work with a number of the organizations that you guys are members of, the International Association of Chiefs of Police, the Governor's Highway Safety uh, Association, and Traffic Safety Resource Prosecutors on a number of the programs that have been, um, and initiatives that have been the subject of your meetings the last couple of days. And for us, over the last five years, really buckling down and trying to understand the drug-impaired driving problem that's now confronting us, both with marijuana and opioids and prescription and over-the-counter drugs. So we appreciate the partnership that we've had, um, both in, in Oklahoma and across the country with all of you. So thank you for all you do. Um, I think many of you are, are familiar with AAA. Um, we, are, we have been around for 118 years, and this year we're celebrating 118 and 60 million members. So we were around when the first transformation in transportation took place, from switch from the horse and buggy to um, 
the car and we're very proud um, and grateful to be around to witness this next transformation in transportation that's likely taking place. Um, so I'd like to uh, spend my time here today providing um, just kind of an overview of the situation as I see it from the, the national landscape and where AAA has been engaged on this issue. And that's primarily on the safety front. Um, but I'll talk about things like consumer accept acceptance, some of the research insights that we've gained, um, upcoming research that we have, the current policy landscape, and the importance of education and collaboration. Um, touched on that. This is um, a slide that I think you're all familiar with and you've probably been talking about the last couple of days, the fact that we lose far too many people on the nation's roads every year, every day. Um, despite a lot of progress over you know, the last decade or 15, 20 years, um, we've seen a, a shift again and fatalities had started going back up after 2014. We've seen a little bit of a tick back down in the last year or two. But the fact that we lose over 35,000 people on the roads every year is a tragedy and something that uh, we, we need to be addressing um, with every tool that we have, um, considering that we've got about one death every 14 minutes, just in the scope of time that we're going to be here this morning for this, this session, we're going to lose four people. Part of the problem we know is that um, many, um, almost all crashes are preventable, and we as humans sometimes make poor decisions when we're behind the wheel. Um, this is data from the AAA Foundation for Traffic Safety's Traffic Safety Culture Index. It's a survey they've been doing for about eight, nine years to gauge, kind of take the pulse of the public on attitudes and behaviors relative to traffic safety. The challenge is, we've kind of uh, phrased it as, we're a do as I say, not as I do culture. We acknowledge that there are behaviors we should not engage in when we're behind the wheel, but we do them anyway. And if you look at, um, for example, reading on a cell phone while driving, almost 100% of people say, that's dangerous, we shouldn't be doing it. Same with texting or emailing. It's dangerous, we shouldn't do it. Yet, almost over 40% of people say that they have read, or, um, read a text or an email in the last 30 days while driving. Same with typing an email or a text. Red light running, same story. We know it's bad, but we've done it and speeding in uh, residential streets. Uh, we know it's bad, but we do it. So the promise for um, autonomous vehicles, vehicle technology in, in the future, um, we recognize is the potential for safety to help eliminate some of that human error. Um, and, and that's why AAA, I think the federal government, a number of industries are so focused on this important issue. And as we're talking about vehicle automation, I think it's really important to understand what we're talking about. And you've probably seen some version of this kind of slide at some point, um, focusing on the levels of automation. It's the Society of Automotive Engineers, NHTSA and others um, have agreed uh, to, to categorize this as six levels of automation, from zero being absolutely no automation in the vehicle at all, to level five, which would be in the future a, future, a fully self-driving vehicle. No human interaction is needed whatsoever. So no steering wheel, no gas pedal, uh, no brake pedal needed. And in between, you've got various different levels um, that can be a little bit confusing, from level one and two, which is what are out on the, out on the streets today, if any of you have maybe a 2018 or later vehicle, you probably have or had the option to have in your car at least one or two kinds of um, driver assistance features in your car. There are no level three vehicles out on the roads today, despite what some people might, might say about their uh, technology in their cars, and no level fours that you or I can own. Um, there are pilot tests of these um, level vehicles out there, but, but not something that you and I can can buy and, and park in a garage. Um, there are some who have ar argued that this, this kind of designation of levels of automation is a little too cluttered and a little too confusing and we should really only have two designations. We should have assisted technology 
and autonomous technology. And so anything kind of four and under is assisted, where a driver still has responsibility, driver needs to um, be prepared to and uh, take control and be engaged. This is a topic that, oops, um, the, the media love, and it's an, an, an easy issue to get caught up in the hype surrounding the potential and what's coming and the cool technology. Um, and I think that makes it difficult for the average person to really understand where we are, what's a realistic time frame, and really what's out there today. Um, I think it would be difficult for the average person in reading these kinds of headlines to realize that you cannot and you will not be able to probably in the next five years at least, if not longer, be able to go to a local dealership and buy a fully self-driving car and park that in your garage for your own use. In the last year or so, I would say we've seen a little bit of a change in the tone by industry. Some walking back of some of the predictions about when fully self-driving vehicles are going to be here. Um, some recognition that um, the time frames were very ambitious and that industry needs to really hunker down and get this right and less talking about um, what, what might be coming. Um, I think this is Im important and helps kind of level set a little bit about where we're at and what the expectations are. And it's a recognition that getting this technology right for every situation and being able to operate on every road, urban, rural, under any circumstances and under any weather conditions is really hard. Um, and it's going to take time to get it right. And I think as we're going along this journey of new technology being introduced in vehicles and working our way toward fully self-driving vehicles, consumer acceptance is going to be an important factor in how quickly any of this happens. So we've been doing some work over the years to try and understand uh, consumer sentiment and consumer feelings around self-driving vehicles, acknowledging that it's hard to really get an accurate um, sense of um, what people will really think about this when it's still kind of an abstract, abstract con concept. Um, most people in the country um, do not have access to, have not experienced a fully self-driving vehicle, depending on where you live, if you live in Chandler, Arizona, um, or Mountain View, California, a few other places in the country, you might have had some exposure or see test vehicles being driven around. But for the most part, people haven't had the opportunity to see, touch, feel, or experience self-driving vehicles. So it's not necessarily surprising that our surveys have shown that there's a little bit of a fear and anxiety about riding in a self-driving car. The survey that we've done over the last several years showed sort of a high, high discomfort. Um, in 2017, about 78% of people said they'd be afraid to ride in a self-driving vehicle. That number started dipping down. But then you'll notice it popped back up again in April of 2018, and that was after some high visibility crashes, the Uber crash in Arizona, Tesla crashes in Florida and elsewhere, um, that got people thinking, uh, got a little more anxiety rising about that, the issue. Similarly, a poll that was done in Oklahoma um, showed that about 80% of people said they would not be willing to ride in a self-driving car, bus, or shuttle if it was available. So maybe a little more uh, anxiety here in Oklahoma than, than the national average. Um, similarly, a, a poll that um, Leslie and Mark did in the state more recently showed the areas of concern for Oklahomans uh, among the, a list of, of options where reliability and safety of the technology were the main concern. Mechanical breakdowns, cost to repair this expensive technology, also a concern. Data and cybersecurity issues, very real concern as well. Um, and again, these aren't surprising when we haven't really had exposure to this to see how it works and see what the functionality is and see how reliable it is. So those numbers are, are likely going to change as more of these technologies get incorporated um, into the system. The good news side of this is that what we're finding in some of our surveys is 
the more people have exposure to and experience with even driver assistance technologies their confidence and comfort level with the technology increases. so drivers who have automated technology or assistance systems in their vehicles are sixty eight percent more likely to trust these features these features. so not surprising but i think it reinforces that it's important that the technology in cars today um, is implemented well and understood well by consumers um, and that it delivers on its promises about, about safety to help um, foster that, that comfort and um, support for those technologies. Next I want to talk about some of the um, research and testing that AAA has undertaken over the last couple of years to get some better understanding of how humans are engaging with and understanding technology in the cars today and some of the testing that we've done of this uh, technology. Through the AAA Foundation for Traffic Safety, we're looking at humor, human interaction with um, advanced driver assistance systems technologies, um, what people understand about it, uh, what they feel and think about it, and with our automotive engineering team in Florida, we've been testing some of the systems that are out there today to better understand how they function and operate. So what we have found um, through some of our automotive engineering testing, we've done testing of these kinds of systems, blind spot monitoring, automatic emergency braking. And what we found is that all of these technologies are implemented differently across vehicle manufacturers and even within a single manufacturer across different models of vehicles and trim levels, the technology operates or functions a little bit differently, which I think might be a surprise to uh, the average person. And it's helped us understand that there are limitations to this technology um, that we're seeing in cars today. As beneficial as it is and as important as we think it's going to be to help improve safety and minimize human error, um, we need to understand that it's, it's not perfect and it doesn't function um, exactly as we might think. So a couple of examples, um, automatic emergency braking systems. Some are designed to slow a vehicle and minimize the impact of a crash. Others are designed to stop a vehicle and completely prevent a crash. So those are two, two different implementations and I think it's important for an owner of a vehicle to understand um, which system they have. And um, because if it is, uh, comes into play at some point, your reaction to and understanding of it and um, your willingness to potentially use it in the future um, could be affected. We also recently did some testing of pedestrian detection systems with combined with automatic emergency braking. And we found some positive results in some standard, um, pretty straightforward testing, but we also found that they are inconsistent and not perfect. And in particular, they are um, not successful in nighttime driving situations or turning around uh, corners, which are some important scenarios where pedestrians are impacted. So our learnings there and our message to um, industry and consumers is these are good technologies to have and in certain scenarios they function very well. But they're not holistic and they're not ready for every scenario. So you need to kind of understand where they work well and where they don't. And you should drive essentially as if you don't have this technology. Because if you start to rely on and depend on too much these technologies, they might let you down. And it's important as well, we think, um, to understand these differences and the limitations of the technology because a knowledge gap can lead to misuse. Some other work that the foundation did with the University of Iowa um, in 2018, 2019, surveyed over 1,200 owners of late model vehicles that have one or more advanced driver assistance systems technologies on the car. Asked them what they think about it, how they feel about it, what they know about the technology, their experience with it. One of the findings there, 29% of drivers who had forward collision warning systems on their cars reported that the system would apply the brakes in case of an emergency. It's a warning system, not an active driver assistance system. It will not apply the brakes. 
so consumers need to understand what the differences are between warning systems and active assistance systems and which system they have in their car as well about twenty five percent of vehicle owners that had forward collision warning systems or lane departure warning systems reported feeling comfortable engaging in other activities while driving because those systems were in place again some potential for misuse or abuse or bad behaviors when those technologies are in place another important learning and important issue that we think is names matter and terms matter and consumers might potentially make a leap to believing that a technology can do more than it can based on its name one of our automotive engineering surveys found that about forty percent of americans expect that a driver support system that has pilot in the name means that the car is can drive by itself which is not what the technology is designed to do it's designed to support not to take over um, and continuing along that line in terms of naming uh... our automotive automotive engineering group did some work, released some work last year, um, looked at about 34 different vehicle brands sold in the U.S. to identify the different, number, the different number of unique names that some of these technology systems have. And, for example, there are at least 40 different terms for the function of automatic emergency braking. Um, there are as many as 20 different terms for adaptive cruise control, lane keep assistance, and blind spot warning. So again, that's the potential to create confusion for consumers and to um, kind of blur the lines between what technology does when we don't have common terms. We were, have been very pleased to be working with, um, late last year, Consumer Reports, J.D. Power, and National Safety Council, and AAA all came together and we put forward, based on that report, consensus recommendations from our organizations. And in January, the U.S. Department of Transportation endorsed that effort to clear the confusion on terminology. Those recommendations are also now pending um, consideration with the Society of Automotive Engineers to try and incorporate that terminology into their standards. And we're hoping that we can continue to keep some pressure on industry for them to adopt um, these standards common terminology. One final research project I'll mention that the foundation has completed last year or this year with uh, Virginia Tech Transportation Institute looked at the differences between people who are new to a driver assistance feature um, and those who have had some time and experience and exposure to it. And they did find that drivers that are new to the technology remained engaged uh, and focused in the driving task perhaps signaling that they don't yet trust the technology. Um, and those who have had more experience, more time with the technology, are more comfortable with it, become disengaged and tend to drive more distracted. So that's an issue that we're going to have to be dealing with going forward with these technologies. We've also got some, um, some additional research coming down the pike. It's a big focus for our foundation. Um, later this year, we'll be releasing some findings um, related to what types and forms of information about these technologies are the most useful in helping consumers understand what a technology is and what it does, which we think will help for driver training and perhaps in um, at the dealership. Um, if it's website or videos or what kinds of training materials and what tone um, is used with those materials will be helpful for the education effort going forward. And now I'll just quickly turn to the policy landscape. And right now there's not a lot happening at the federal level. Um, in the 115th Congress, we had a bill passed in the House and a bill under consideration in the Senate to um, establish some federal oversight and regulations, a structure for automated vehicles. Um, neither of those bills were able to pass by the end of session, so they died. Um, this year, Congress is taking a slightly different approach, or last year and this year, uh, a bicameral approach. So committee staff from the House and the Senate 
have come together and they're developing sections of an automated federal automated vehicle bill releasing a couple of sections at a time to stakeholders for feedback unclear if that's going to result in uh, the introduction of a bill and passage of a bill by the end of this year I would say the prospects are not good given the legislative calendar and the fact that we're we're in a presidential election year so the the number of legislative working days for Congress are are short and there's a lot of other priorities that they want to be focusing on so jury's out on that um, in the meantime US um, the White House US DOT have released the next iteration of their AV guidance um, AV 4.0 um, that was released at CES this year and um, it doesn't contain any new real policy guidance um, for states or the industry it's more taking a, a broader picture at how the whole of government is approaching um, the issue with some AV government-wide AV principles um, what the administration is doing to foster uh, technology growth and leadership and federal activities and opportunities um, for collaboration going forward so for now um, the best guidance from the federal government is contained in the prior years of policy guidelines um, so that's 3.0 2.0 um, and again these are just guidelines for industry and stakeholders and states it's not regulation um, so it's it's things to take into consideration, best practices, recommendations for states. And that's, that's the, the best that we've got right now um, at the federal level. So while there's been a bit of a lack of um, clear direction at the federal level, the states have really picked up the issue and have been running with it. We've got 36 states in the District of Columbia that have AV-related bills or laws, oops, um, and 11 states that have issued AV executive orders and 23 states that have NDC that have AV task forces so there's been a lot of activity in Oklahoma you're all very familiar you've got an AV steering committee that's active and last year took some steps um, to create uh, the mobility in public office of mobility and public transit allowing vehicle platooning which I think there's a um, a strong sense that the commercial vehicle sector will be a place where we'll start to see a lot of this technology being implemented uh, more quickly than maybe passenger vehicles and um, focusing on keeping the regulation of AVs at the state level rather than county and municipality level our recommendations for Oklahoma and I think for for every state where where we've been talking about this is to put safety first and make sure that there's some reporting requirements if testing is happening in the state um, include some con consumer perspective perspective bring them into some of the policy discussions looking at your state code to see um, if there's any impediments for AV testing and deployment that need to be addressed ensure tra transparency so that the consumers and the, and the public know what's going on and have opportunities to ask questions and then I would say there's a wealth of information both from other states other national organizations I mentioned Governor's Highway Safety Association the American Association of Motor Vehicle Administrators AASHTO National League of Cities everybody's focused on this and doing work and there are a lot of good uh, reports and best practices that are there that you can um, build off of nobody needs to reinvent the wheel I don't think on this and as I mentioned before I think education and collaboration are really important um, technology is moving so fast and things are changing so quickly and there's a lot of different people that are working on this and by coming together to collaborate on best practices and sharing of information and um, everybody focusing on the education component I think um, that's going to be very important going forward for our part um, AAA is active at the national level and uh, within the states looking for opportunities to collaborate technology takes the wheel is is one of the forums that we've been using to talk about this issue uh, at the national level AAA is involved with a, a coalition of sorts called partners for AV education pave and it involves a number of um, vehicle manufacturers 
technology companies, startups, um, insurance industry, National Federation of the Blind, MAD, number of organizations that are interested in the safe development and deployment of vehicle automation. And everybody's come together focused on education only, not focused on advocating for a particular policy um, or, or regulation, um, but focused on education without the hype, realistic timelines, realistic information. We're all committed to that. Um, so I've talked a about a, a lot of issues from the safety perspective, things that um, have been the primary focus for AAA. There are a host of other issues that still need to be addressed and tackled um, as we evolve into more technology in the vehicle and a future potential future state of self-driving cars. This is a, a short list of some of those issues, but know that at the national level and within the states, there are a number of conversations going on about liability, about insurance, and the future there um, may not be clear until we do start to get some of these vehicles out on the road and we start to have some situations where vehicles are crashing and they go to court and um, the courts might be deciding some of what happens in, in liability in this situation. In the near term, we're likely going to have some cars with technology, some cars without technology, human driven, some with assist, driver assistance features, potentially some self-driving um, vehicles out there on the road mixing together and what does that mean for liability or insurance? Big questions that need to be grappled with. Questions about licensure, who needs to be licensed when we move toward uh, more self-driving vehicles and how do we train drivers or occupants of passengers of the future? What does that look like? Um, data privacy and cybersecurity, I think, are the, the big kahuna issues. Um, and it's not just within transportation. Um, everything Internet of Things has data privacy and cybersecurity challenges. If we can't successfully figure out those kinds of, of protections, um, I think there's there's going to be a hard time getting consumer acceptance um, for these technologies. And as I mentioned already, uh, mixed fleet, we're going to see mixed fleet of vehicles, I think, for a long time. Human driven, um, driver assisted technologies and self driving mixing together for quite some time. And all of that as well is potentially going to have workforce impacts in the, the freight industry, taxis, uh, you name it. Lots of, lots of implications across the board. So I'll just conclude by saying AAA is very excited about the potential, primarily the safety benefits and mobility benefits of what's ahead. Um, it's incredibly important that um, we're still as well a little cautious about it so that the technology is implemented in a safe and transparent manner. Um, the rush to AV should not come at the expense of safety. Um, and we've all got to understand, I think, bring the public along on this, this journey, however long it takes. So I'll conclude with one final slide about uh, another potential um, implication of an AV future that we'll hear in a future country music song. Oops. So thank you. I appreciate, again, the opportunity to be here, to be in a room with a bunch of traffic safety, passionate traffic safety advocates, and again, thank you for all that you guys do. said there's some time for questions, so I'm happy to take a couple questions if there are any from any from the floor. If not, we can answer. Oh, sure. Uh, the, uh, the Yeah, that's a, that's a great question, and I don't know if everybody heard it, but whether our surveys 
so far have um, included any questioning about comfort level um, being around uh, commercial vehicle platoons. So far we have not, but I do think it's something that we'll um, focus on in the future. And we have been, um, in some states that have already authorized pilot tests of platooning, we have been arguing that there needs to be public announcements, people need to know what's happening, there needs to be you know, placards or, or visibility signage on trucks so that uh, they understand what, what's going on. Because um, it could definitely be intimidating to be along uh, a platoon of two, three, four, five uh, commercial vehicles spaced very closely together. And you know, we've got questions about what does that mean for egress, ingress onto and off of um, interstates, um, the ability for a passenger vehicle to cut into a platoon to exit, the, all, all kinds of, of questions out there related to platooning as well. Any other questions? We really lost a leader in traffic safety when we lost Peter last year. Um, and AAA, Dr. Kissinger, who was a longtime leader at AAA, and I will tell you, he helped me as a graduate student about 30 years ago when I was working on some research on pedestrian safety. So your touch to everyone who works in research and across the United States is just incredible, So, and your well, passion. Thank you very much, and I agree. We lost a, 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 an important traffic safety champion uh, when Peter passed away. Hi, another question. Yeah. Uh, would you say there's a, is, is there one significant bottleneck more than the others um, regarding when, when we're going to get this technology on the road for mass consumption? Is it um, the actual technology and figuring out the safety, or is it uh, uh, governments uh, allowing testing or encouraging it or providing the kind of guidelines that you talked about? Where's the, the big bottleneck? Um, I guess just from, from my perspective, I, I think it's probably more about getting the technology right um, everywhere, every time, any, any circumstances. Um, I think we are going to start to see in the very near future, and w there are some places already, in defined geographic um, locations that will have self-driving technology out on the roads, and maybe it's university campuses, maybe it's senior centers, maybe it's um, more defined urban centers that are geofenced, pre-mapped, um, to at least start to get the um, systems out there, get some exposure to it, um, and there'll be fleets of vehicles, so then there can be a determination made if the weather's bad, they aren't gonna be out on the road, versus you or I, having that car and having the ability to make that decision by ourselves, not knowing whether the technology can take it or not. I think that's gonna be um, the technology assurance along with things like cybersecurity are gonna be big challenges. Another question, uh, as a state traffic engineer, uh, uh, if this technology is dependent upon uh, roadway striping, will this place an additional liability on the shoulders of government? Yeah, I think that's an important question as well. Um, I think right now the technologies are pretty dependent on some striping and, and lane markings and the, the type of sensors and radar and, and cameras that are in the cars right now. I do think it's gonna put a, a, a burden in terms of, we don't have the resources now to maintain the roads uh, in the condition that they need to be in. Um, if we're gonna have cars that are more dependent on having good striping and, and lane markings, where are we gonna get the investment to make sure that that happens and what does that mean for rural gravel roads and the ability for these kinds of vehicles to, to traverse um, different, kite, different uh, types of road structures. But I do think there can potentially be some additional
burden on um, state DOTs. Any other questions? If not, thanks again. Appreciate the opportunity to be here.